good evening all. Um, thanks all for, I'm going to say coming out, but uh, I don't think we're doing that much anymore. But uh, a couple of people have asked, will the slides be available post the event? Yes, I can send a PDF of the slides um, post event uh, and uh, hopefully it will generate some, uh, some conversation and some thought. Um, I guess the big thing to ask you to consider both from the outset and right the way through is what it is that you as an individual coach and the environment that you uh, currently coach or work in, what is its purpose? What is it that it's aiming towards? Because uh, I guess the focus this evening is to speak about broad aim, uh, broad perspective about what it is that someone or an environment might be aiming towards. And then as a consequence, how that possibly transcends into the way that the environment is structured how that plays out on a season basis, and then hopefully towards the end, how that plays out on an individual sessional basis. But the intention is, is that we won't be jumping straight into session planning first. It will be that session planning and experience design will probably be a broader reflection of the things that an environment thinks are important. Um, I, I don't particularly want to spend too long speaking about myself for a collection of reasons, but along the bottom are just some of the environments that I've been fortunate enough to work in across the last 25 years. Um, 10 years where I guess uh, I guess most of my tentative early years of learning to coach at Colchester United in both a community programme and a boys and a girls excellence programme. Uh, it's followed by two years at Chelsea, uh, uh, loosely responsible for trying to establish and drive the women's football programme forward. Uh, 12 years with the Football Association as a, a coaching coach developer. Um, just over a year now uh, working at Fulham as Sean kindly introduced as the head of coaching. So no suggestion that um, 25 years of doing something means that you've got it right or that you know what you're doing, but perhaps some of the environments that have both influenced me and at varying stages I've sought to influence. And I guess this sort of um, my experiences, I guess, have developed. The sort of quote that's on the screen has probably become more and more um, clear, more and more prevalent. Um, if individualism and creativity are important, then the environment has to champion them. So I guess from an alignment perspective, Perspective. If an environment states that those things are important, it's probably then really key that every single thing that we do, every strategy that we employ, every individual tactic that we employ as much as possible aligns with making sure that the individual is at the heart of what we do and that hopefully we set up the environment in such a way that it supports creativity to emerge. Uh, I guess thinking about your own environment, whatever it is that you and your environment hold dear, how is it that every single day your environment champions that? pursues it and ensures that there's a clear alignment between we say X is important as a consequence, we're in pursuit of Y. Uh, I guess most of my role, most of my life has been about trying to influence coaching and learning. Um, and I guess probably before we get into understanding too much about what coaching might look like and how we want to influence learning, it's probably important to have a consideration about what that might mean and how we might feel that that plays out. So you'll see four points come up on the screen. I'll speak about them individually, but important to recognise that they're all hugely connected and a huge influence on each other. So point one is the consideration that the game of football and players are complex. And by complex, it just fundamentally means that they're never exactly the same. A lady called Frances Wesley sought to suggest that tasks could be separated in three ways. They were simple, like baking a cake. You get a particular recipe, you follow it, and largely you get the same uh, outcome at the end of the, the, the baking experience. Complicated, she likened it to sending a rocket to the moon. It takes lots and lots of specialists and lots of different parts, but a rocket is a non-human machine. The moon is where the moon is, and once you've done it once, you probably build skill at being able to do it again. She likened parenting to being complex, but for the purpose of this, I'll suggest that coaching and certainly player development are complex that years and years of doing it probably help you in terms of the way that you approach it. But every single child is different. Every single coach is different. Every single environment that you're exposing them to is different. So as a consequence, we probably need to think about the way that we approach that, that standardized, top-down, recipe-focused approaches to coach and player development are possibly not that helpful. As a consequence, it's probably important to understand that when we change one aspect, it will create ripple effects elsewhere. If I coach the right back to do a particular thing, it will knock on to what the right side of centre half does, to what the right winger does. But in the same way, it'll also knock on to what their left midfielder who might be pressing him or her seeks to do. So as soon as we change one thing, it cannot not ripple elsewhere as a consequence of the fact that this is a human interaction and there are more than one human interacting. As a coach, and as people that are responsible for supporting player and coach development to seek to address these consciously and effectively, 
but largely to do that from a guiding, perhaps more facilitative perspective, which is point four, that we make positive contributions of subtle adjustment to the environment to affect change. So the coach may, may be the orchestrator, but not necessarily the orchestrator that's on the pitch, pulling everything about to make it hugely reflect them, but more recognising the subtleties and the difference of each of the people that are in their environment and understanding how best to support their development. So how does that all pull itself together? Vision focused, values driven. So from a personal perspective, what are you aiming at? So I'll ask you again, as a group of people hopefully sat listening, what is it that your environment is aiming at? At Fulham, our vision is about individuals who can fulfill their potential, can cut through language, I guess, in many different ways, but I guess central to that is that the individual is key. However, it's important to recognize that certainly in football and any other team sport, the individual has to function within some kind of structure as a team. So individual is one part, uh, and the second part is about potential. And I guess, depending upon your perspective, potential is probably a, re a reality that hasn't yet been realized. So as a club, our vision is about seeking to put each individual central to their own development and to try and ensure that they can realize a reality that hasn't yet been achieved yet. So that's what we're aiming for. That's the, uh, I guess, the big picture objective, but that's underpinned by the values. So vision focused, this is what we're aiming for. Values driven, these are the things that we won't sacrifice in pursuit of our vision. So at Fulham, there are three, hard work, humility, honesty. And again, every single person will interpret those either subtly or significantly different. But in pursuit of this vision, don't sacrifice hard work, honesty and humility in pursuit of it. So again, big picture stuff, what are you aiming for? What things will fundamentally, what values will fundamentally underpin how you pursue it? What's then a framework for development, both for players and coaches? And I guess three elements, Carl Newell's approach to kind of constraints-led approach to coaching, I guess, informs much of this. And the idea being that player is probably the start point. Who are the players in your care? What things do they bring to the table? What I guess is currently within their disposition? And perhaps what are some of the qualities that the environment might like to support the development of in those people? Second element is the laws of football and that's deliberate language. I think principles of play are overstated. There are 17 laws of football. Players principally self-organise based upon the laws of football. So offside is a law of football that defines how you move. Set plays, goal kicks, etc., etc., are a fundamental element of the game that inform how you move and play football. The idea of kicking in the opposition's goal or heading it in the opposition's goal more times than they head it or kick it in yours fundamentally informs the way that the players move. So consider the disposition or the predisposition of the players and some of the characteristics that we want to support the development of and then the way in which the game of football emerges. So player, laws of football and then what environment are they being exposed to? So the environment on a day like today might be a training session. We're going to do it in a tight area and we're going to seek to affect class capacity to play forward. It might be that we're taking a group of boys to an overseas competition and the environment there is different. Games come thick and fast. Pressures perhaps heightened. They're playing in front of crowds. They're playing against oppositions that perhaps they haven't played against previously. So who are the players? How does the game of football play out? And what environment is it that we're being exposed to in that moment? And then the design piece sits in the middle. So as coach, I guess, of, uh, if the coach is orchestrator, the coach's responsibility is the degree to which they design the environment to understand and reflect the specific needs or perceived needs of the player the way that that coach hopes that the laws of football will play out and the specific environment that they're being exposed to. And that point from earlier about player and coach development being complex, it's probably important to recognise that whenever the player changes, whenever the way that the laws of football are interpreted or the opposition that you're playing against and or the environment that they're being exposed to changes, the solution to the problem probably changes. So probably some of the historical examples of the way that we've thought about football coaching, which is the way to pass the ball from A to B is this, and this is the specific technique for passing it from A to B. That may be just one way of solving that particular passing solution. It's not necessarily the universal way. So the idea that we're going to uh, coach specific solutions that are universal to every single player in every single event is possibly mistaken. Possibly you need to recognise that when the player is different, when the laws are being interpreted differently, and when the environment is different, then it may mean that the solution is different and our design should probably be considerate of that. I guess both in my time at the association and certainly at Fulham, 
what we're trying to do is to strip away a lot of the kind of weight that can sometimes be caught in coaching where we end up with page after page after page of philosophical documents which coaches and players have to spend a significant amount of time understanding before they can decide how to coach I guess what we're fundamentally trying to strip it back to is who are the players in your care how do you see the game of football playing out what environment are being are they being exposed to and then as a consequence decide in your design how to set practice up and then principally how to coach how to set practice up and how to coach and from a player development perspective practice is probably game day as well because all of it is opportunity to prepare them for hopefully the destination that they're aspiring towards which certainly in our setting is to play professional football ideally for them to be playing that at Fulham. Um, final thing on this is that we would ask the coaches to decide what that looks like and as much as possible for coach and player development to be deeply connected. The risk historically is that coach development plans can be designed and placed on a shelf on one side of the office, whilst player development plans are designed and placed on the opposite side of the office. And we can end up with coaches in pursuit of becoming a first team coach, whilst not necessarily understanding and recognising the needs of the individuals whilst they're in pursuit of that. It's so hugely important that we recognise that what the coach is working at is deeply aligned to what the players are working at because if the two things aren't we're likely to end up with a misalignment so hopefully a relatively kind of loose framework a loose territory that each coach and player can kind of stitch their own uh, journey into can enable them to decide what's important and be supported through that move on how might we go about doing that um, this is just an example for, from a publication uh, that was fortunate to be published in about three, four years ago now. Um, and I, I guess the reason for highlighting this particular, not publication, but this particular approach is that a lot of practice books, a lot of playbooks get straight into here is a session on running with the ball, here is a session on playing out from the back. And perhaps the risk can be that we don't necessarily consider our overall vision for both the team and the players in the way that we put practice together. So one of the quotes from the article is that the practice works back from the vision for the team and the players. So we don't have a wasted practice. We don't just decide to put on a practice because it's in page 73 of a playbook and we think that might be a good decision. We fundamentally decide what practice looks like as a consequence of what our vision was, both for the overall environment, but then specifically for the team and the players. And the example here that you'll see illustrated is just a team that plays with a back three. But the fundamental element of that plan with that back three is for the centre halves to have the capacity to be able to step out. That's something that's key for both the development of those centre backs and also key for the way that that team might be supported to develop. That point about where you have impact on one thing, it has ripple effects elsewhere. Whilst we ask the centre half to do particular things, so the left side of centre half, who's right footed in that example, encouraging him to step out across that deep third line into the midfield that will naturally knock on to the movements and the things that the midfielders do and the decisions that the forwards make higher up the pitch. So even though we might place a particular focus on a particular area or certain players, it's important to recognise that there's a knock-on effect to other players, which even if we're not explicitly coaching, we may need to be mindful of. So focus on the coaches, overall framework that they might decide how to practice, and then as a consequence, how might they start to consider what any given piece of work looks like. And here's just a personal way that I try to go about designing the environment. So we've got a vision that we want every practice to represent that vision and to re represent the perceived needs of the team and the players. Um, and I guess practice in itself can sometimes be, as previously alluded to, a playbook of 50 practices that people turn to and select, um, which probably isn't that helpful because you're already fundamentally prescribing prescriptions to coaches and players without necessarily understanding what it is that they need. And in the event of doing that, if it doesn't work for a coach, it's probably a fault of the prescription because it's very, very difficult to decide what a group of people need until you've understood what their needs are and understood the things that they're trying to achieve. On the opposite end of the spectrum, the risk can be that you say to coaches, start with a blank piece of paper. And depending upon your degree of experience, that can be quite daunting. So there's three stages to this particular structure which hopefully enables coaches to consider some ingredients that they might mix to develop their own practice that perhaps better responds to the needs of their team and the needs of their individual players. 
but also to sit behind it, what's the rationale for selecting those particular things in any given moment. And then the right-hand side, consider the diet that we're going to give those players, both perhaps on any given session, in any given week, but possibly more importantly, along a player development journey. And if, for example, we decide we want players who we want to have more adaptive expertise, who can respond in the moment, who can play a collection of systems, there's probably a good chance that we need to consider that in the way that we structure practice. Alternatively, if we have a view that we want to be more command, we want to be more routine expertise focused where players know exactly what their role is, we have relatively narrow profiles, we ask people to do quite specific things, that probably informs the way that we structure the diet of practice that we expose those players to. And the risk is, is that you know, federations, the game generally sort of leads people down wanting to pursue adaptive expertise wanting to have players that are adaptable, that can deal with a collection of different situations. And as a consequence, perhaps more of a games-based approach. Now, whilst that would be my preference, it's important that we don't impose that on other people. If someone's vision is to get a team to win, and as a consequence, they want to develop more routine expertise, I think, I think it's important that we respect, understand that, and support the process in a, in, a, in a relevant way, not necessarily just draw them towards something that we think is important. So part one of this environment design, if you like, is about the pitch size and shape that is uh, selected and the way in which the players are then distributed linked to our beliefs and the style of play that we're trying to embody. And in this example, there are four pitch sizes and shapes that you might choose from, big, small, narrow and wide. And again, not good or bad, but probably important to recognise that if we go for a big pitch, it's a decent chance it's going to probably give you more of what might be perceived to be an extensive type of load more longer distance running, probably slower longer distance running, probably more time on the ball to make decisions. Not necessarily good or bad, but hopefully uh, relevant if we want spacing behind defenders, as an example. If you want to create one versus ones where the players that get on the ball have got some opportunity to build up some speed and get after people. If we want perhaps higher numbers of players on the pitch to be able to inform the decisions that they make away from the ball. Small pitch, conversely, probably tight, less opportunity to have time to make decisions, probably a little bit more instinctive. And a lot of the movements that you get are probably more intensive. Probably accelerations and decelerations happen in a shorter space of time, probably stopping and doing a lot of those jarring, jolting movements, more movements, sorry, more of the time than you might be on a big pitch. Again, not good or bad, but if you want particular returns, think about the diet that you give them. If we go very much down the small pitch side of things, you will probably end up with players who are really, really good in the tight, who can twist, turn and get away from pressure and deal with pressure. The risk is, is they might not have the legs or to, or, or to be able to understand when to run in behind. Similarly, if we go for a big pitch, you might have players that can see the bigger picture, that can deal with the distance, but perhaps haven't got the touch and release skills to deal with it when it's tight and people are leaning on and they're under pressure. Other two pitch shapes, narrow pitch and a wide pitch. Principally, an example that we'll talk through soon, a narrow pitch gives players the opportunity to focus on playing forward. The space in between the opposition is probably tighter and narrower than it would normally be, which means you've really got to sharpen your eye. And I guess that idea of kind of the overload principle on decision-making, if you make it harder in training than it is in the game, there's probably a decent chance that you overload a brain, which means when the space opens out in a real game, perhaps we're more informed, more ready, better positioned to be able to form well in, uh, in that game. But also from a physical perspective, narrow pitches will probably give you more forwards and backwards movement, up and down, vertical movement up and down the pitch. And certainly players that individually will need to twist and turn their hips to be able to work through 180 degrees. A wide pitch will probably give you more side to side or lateral movement of both the ball and the human body. Again, not good or bad, but it'll probably mean that because the space is wide, the ball will go wide more. Perhaps good if you want to focus on crossing and finishing, defending in wide areas teams are setting up as a block we're going to be hard to break down and maybe get moved across the pitch in different ways to make it hard for the opposition to break through them again similar to big or small not good or bad if we do lots of stuff on narrow pitches chances are we're going to get good at being able to play through the risk is is that everything's forward pass everything's forward thinking not necessarily bad but perhaps we don't get into the uh, we don't necessarily build the capacity to go across the pitch to move people about to slow the game down and then recognise when we might then consequently speed it up. So four pitch shapes and sizes. And what we would seek to do on whichever one of those pitch shapes or sizes that we use, we would seek to distribute the players in a way that represents the way that we want to play. 
and we'll articulate that and illustrate that in a little bit more detail as we work forward. Second element is to decide on the parameters that we might use to constrain movement or decisions. Again, four traditional horizontal thirds, defensive third, midfield third, attacking third, vertical thirds, effectively left hand side, central right hand side, half pitch, which would probably be good for getting defenders pushed up the pitch to create space in behind, ensure offside is adhered to, etc., etc. Possibly my favourite one is just where you have a central circle in the middle of the pitch. And if you're trying to encourage midfielders to get on the ball and play through 360 degrees, it might be that you say try and play through the central circle before you attack the goal, which means the defenders have got to play into tight areas. Midfielders have got to be good at feeling pressure, understanding the pace of the ball and being able to turn away from pressure, let the ball run across their body, combine in tight areas. I guess for those of us that are quite pure that like to see good midfield players, that's perhaps a good way of organising the pitch to support those things to happen. Again, just some ingredients that people might choose from, but being mindful that, for example, if we chose thirds that went vertical, where you've got a left-hand side, a central side and a right-hand side, if we wanted to work on switching play, we might start to think about conditions on the game that say try and visit all of the three areas before you attack the goal, which perhaps gets people moving the ball across the pitch before they attack the goal. Third element after the, we've spoken about the design is I guess the demands that we place upon the players. And there's three up there, restrict, you must, reward, if you do this, you'll get that, relate, spot the times to. So by relate, it suggests that the player relates the, the situation that they're in to the task that they've been set. So just as a way of seeking to illustrate some of those, restrict, I guess your traditional restriction might have been you must play one touch which in itself is fine. It gets you probably a high repetition of one touch play, but probably reduces the decisions that the player can make about the things that inform when playing one touch is the right thing to do. So in using restrict, I would probably limit them from one or two decisions rather than limit them only down to one choice. So an example on that one touch might be play one touch or four or more. So play quick or stay on the ball for longer, knowing that if you're on four touches or more, after you've taken your second touch, you're probably going to get some pressure. But the player's still got a choice. They can choose to take one touch or they can take four or more. I guess what England have in recent years called stay on the ball, stick with the ball, deal with pressure, find creative ways to get out of tight situations. Reward, that might be that you reward the behaviour that you want. So as an example, uh, we ran a must-win tournament uh, quite a few years ago now as part of a course that we were running where we had uh, four teams played each other twice on a small pitch and then on a big pitch. And the, the uh, way that the competition was structured, that you got three points for a win, no points for a draw and no points for a defeat. So part of the purpose between choosing that particular award is that we wanted teams to pursue victory, not settle for draws. So as a consequence, there's no point for a draw. It's effectively the same as getting beat. So pursue victory. And when you get in front, be really, really re resolute, really, really thoughtful about the way in which you secure and hold on to that lead to see the game out. So fundamentally reward the behaviour or the things that you want players to focus on and perhaps find, I'm not saying that's particularly clever, but seek to find clever and inventive ways that encourage players towards the things that you think might be important. Final one is relate, which is perhaps spot the times to. So you might say to a team, recognise the times to inject speed into the attack. So by using that language, it suggests that there may be times that you'll slow it down. M maybe move the ball from side to side, move the opposition from side to side, but then fundamentally spot the times to go quick. But it's a decision. Don't just go quick all of the time, spot the moments to go quick. As an overview for these three points, possibly important to recognise that there may be times where we would restrict, relate or reward every single player in the whole of the practice. So effectively, everybody is constrained by the same task or challenge. There may be times where we've got a collection of different players that are working towards different restrictions. And then obviously it becomes supportive of the players and incumbent upon the coach to make sure they've got a clear understanding of how to support and manage that themselves. There may be moments where we've got different teams, which hopefully you'll see illustrated soon, that are working towards different challenges and the way that the players are positioned perhaps enable their team to practice particular things. So... They're not necessarily arbitrary conditions that we would place on everybody. It may be that we're a little bit more subtle, a little bit more thoughtful in the way that we focus upon particular individuals. And as much as possible, the stuff around the outside, the ingredients that we choose to mix, needs to be underpinned by a clear rationale about why we're mixing those particular ingredients. And over a period of time, be mindful of the diet that we've exposed people to. 
because for example using lots and lots of restrict tasks with players will probably be good for getting repetition but it's perhaps less good for cognition and decision making so the risk may be that the players just become informed by the restrictions and don't necessarily think about the right things to do so important that we're mindful about the diet that we expose people to okay I'm going to pause for a couple of minutes before going into some session planning and some greater detail but I guess something that's stuck in my mind over a number of years, which perhaps is being returned to in traditional coach education is the use of structured starts. Um, and I guess the practices that you'll see shortly uh, in terms of the way that they're designed are large numbered games, small numbered games, where there aren't structured starts. The key for the coach is to decide how they're gonna set the practice up to enable repetition of the things that they want. And that's perhaps where the skill comes in the design. The risk is, is that coach education or coaching leads people down the, the, the road of taking a structured start. So for example, the ball will start here with a central midfielder, they'll dribble five yards forward and when they've done that, we play live, which in principle is fine for I guess setting up in a particular situation that you like, but it doesn't necessarily re re reflect and represent the complexity that is in coaching, which is every time I travel from the midfield, the situation will be subtly or significantly different. I think the other risk is, is that players are triggered to start from the structured start, not triggered to recognise the things that occur in the game, particularly in moments of transition that lead to people making particular judgments. And as I guess as an offshoot of that, I'd ask people to consider if you're being asked to use structured starts, just recognise that they're already in the game, the cool set plays, the goal kicks, the corners, the throw-ins, the free kicks. And perhaps if we want to see a greater representation of structured starts, we might just constrain a game so that every time the ball goes dead, we start from a corner, for example, which will get you a higher repetition of those particular set plays and enable structured starts to occur. So I'm not saying don't or never, but be careful about employing structured starts because it might be really, really good for getting your repetition of a particular picture, but bear in mind that that picture changes every single time and the players are probably learning to adapt to the structured start, not learning to adapt to the actual situation that might occur in the game. Okay, so seek to go into a couple of practical examples now. Before I start rabbiting on about what will be in this, I'll ask you to think right back to the beginning. Vision, individuals who can fulfill their potential, values, hard work, honesty, humility. So they're the central things that drive our thinking. The triangle of who are the players? What are the laws of football and how do we expect them to play out today? What are the environment that they're being exposed to? And this is just a, a, a piece of work that reflects that, that is designed to embody those things and hopefully then utilises the previous slide as the, I guess the ingredients that we mix to perhaps get a particular piece of work. So I'll talk through it and in the notes that we'll share at the end, there is a five minute video which just is a demonstration of this particular practice playing out with a group of players, which will hopefully give it a deeper illustration beyond what you'll see in front of you here. So here we go. Now, depending upon your view, I guess, certainly in my time at the association, before that working at Chelsea and now at Fulham, we're trying to encourage coaches, assuming systems are important, to work from more than one system so the players don't become rigidly, routinely expert at playing in a particular system and a particular role, which when it changes, have limited uh, experience to be able to draw on. So the video of this session that you'll see was working with a an age group that had committed to playing two systems across the season. The first system, which you'll see with the yellows, is a 4-3-3 or a 4-2-3-1, depending upon your view. So you've got a traditional back four, two deeper um, or, or screening midfielders, the four and the eight, the yellow number 10, who seeks to play in between the lines, and the outside forwards or midfielders, the seven and the 11, supported by a central number nine. The second system that this age group were keen to employ was a three box three, which again, hopefully you'll see there. And the number two is effectively a right-sided center half. The number three is a left-sided center half and the number five is your central center half. Four box midfielder, so four and a six, 10 and an eight, and then three relatively narrow forwards, a seven, a nine, and an 11. And one of the challenges with the way that the three box three is set up is that people say there isn't a lot of width. And people use terms like all time width to suggest that width is important. And whilst it may be important to some people, I don't think it's universally important. Two points, width is probably relative. Uh, and perhaps, you know, I guess you look at sort of a Rigo Sarchi, uh, sorry, Rigo Sarchi, look at uh, Sarri's teams uh, at Napoli and at Chelsea, 
typically set the teams up to be quite narrow, to go through, to have people coming straight down the line of the ball, which may be encouraged the presser to come and create space in behind. So width isn't necessarily universal, and this uh, age group were particularly keen to develop the capacity to play narrow, to play through people, to keep players tightly connected, both for quick combinations and also to be able to press quickly on the turnover. So they might be the two systems that an age group were using or that this age group were keen to use. As a consequence, practice should probably reflect those two systems. Naturally, it's unlikely that we'll get 22 players in every or any session. So the particular example that you'll see had 17 players in, so we needed to lose five. We lost those five, which left the yellows playing with nine and the uh, reds playing with eight. So there's your 17 players, obviously two goalkeepers. Now, the pitch area was going to be relatively tight, but the particular focus was on the pitch being narrow, which will hopefully become apparent soon. So the players are positioned like so. There's your pitch. Hopefully you'll see on the right-hand side, as you look at the screen, the goal at that end is five yards further up than it is on the left-hand side. Just a small subtlety, the Reds are obviously defending a man down, uh, so perhaps slightly less space to defend. Um, so you'll now see that your um, yellow team have effectively got the representation of three of their back four, full backs and the centre back, two of their midfield, three of their front three. The Reds going back the other way, who are playing the three box three, have got their central centre halves, one holding midfielder and the front three. Now, individual tasks that the players are working at and team tasks that the players are working at. So consider that the Yellows have got an extra man and the goalkeeper for the Yellows was working upon shorter distribution. The left back, the number three, was working on his recovery runs. The yellow five was working on defending one versus one. The front three, the seven, the nine and the 11 were working on playing against the deep defence, which as the way that plays out will become apparent shortly. And the number 10, who's one of his favourite players historically has been Fabregas, wanted to work on some of those Fabregas passes where you're high up the pitch, where the defence is tight and narrow and you've really got to thread the eye of the needle to get the ball through. So there's some of the individual focuses for those particular players. The red team, conversely, team of eight. Goalkeeper working on playing longer. The two, the three and the five being tough to break down. The number four, who was a relatively high-performing player or perceived to be a high-performing player in this group, who perhaps struggled when things weren't going particularly well, respond positively when it's difficult. And the central forward, who you'll see in the video, is called Rio, is recognising when to come to feet and when to run space. So the players have been positioned on their teams principally because of the individual focuses that are in their development programme. So that point about starting with the player, that's why they've been positioned accordingly. Second element in terms of the way that we want the game of football to play out, so the laws of football or principles of the game, if people perceive those to be important. The yellows are going to be working on possessing the ball in the opposition's half. At Fulham, we might call that control in possession. The reds are going to be working on intelligent defending, as we would call it, so recognising how and when to defend. Now, I guess the traditional view of coach one team, coach one theme, which is fairly inherent in coach education processes for a number of years, can perhaps be challenged. Because the risk is if you only coach the yellows on possessing the ball in their half and don't coach the reds on being tough to beat, the risk is that the yellows get a relatively easy path to goal because the reds feel like they're dummies and they don't feel that they're focusing on a particular task. So if we constrain and challenge the reds to defend with real intensity, we're consciously making it harder for the yellows, which hopefully means that the learning will be stronger, the adaptation will be more relevant to the way in which we want to play the game of football. So initially in this practice, we just encourage the yellows to get as high up the pitch, to get as many players in the opposition's half as you possibly could, and to control possession. Spot the times to break lines, spot the moments to take the opportunity to score on goal. The Reds, man down, you'll see less of the ball, be really tough to break down, be really intense and competitive near to the goal, and when you win it, counter quickly. Hopefully then that starts to lead into some of the individual tasks. If we encourage the yellows into the opposition's half, that left back, called Malachi in the video, will probably end up high up the pitch. If the Reds counter quickly, there's a good chance that the ball will get played in behind and he'll get the opportunity to focus on his recovery runs. The number nine, Rio, for the Reds, who's practicing on when to come to feet and when to come to space. If the goalkeeper at his end is playing longer more of the time, 
He'll need to recognise, perhaps in transition, when to come short and receive to his body and hold it up, when to spin in behind, which challenges the yellow five, which if you look to the bottom left-hand side of the screen, they're practising defending one versus one. So the design of the, the practice hopefully enables the individual player's tasks to be central, more than one theme or element of the way in which the game might be played to be focused upon, and for those things to kind of work against each other to generate real competition and focus. What you'll see, uh, should you choose to watch the video that we send you, is for the final elements, uh, so the final few moments, the, the last two games of this particular session, we said to the yellows, the number of passes that you make in the opposition's half equals that number of goals if you score. So get four passes, score, four goals. So it says build solid possession. The more you build possession and score, the more you're rewarded for it. But be careful about just, you know, like your arbitrary eight pass, 10 pass counts where people just get up to eight without necessarily using it based upon the situation. Be careful because if you just arbitrarily build passes, there is a risk that you turn the ball over and then make yourself vulnerable going back the other way. So yes, try to build and you'll be rewarded for the more that you build, but also spot the times to cash it in and score in the goal. Similarly for the Reds, on the regain, 10 seconds, the number of seconds left on the clock equals that number of goals. So score after three seconds when there's seven seconds left, seven goals. So it says win it back, go quick. And the reason that we put those conditions in towards the end was to increase the intensity and to increase the competition. Early on in the session, we just encouraged, possess the ball in their half, try to play on the counter. So perhaps reduce some of that intensity, reduce some of that pressure to support the learning. And perhaps once people have got a deeper understanding of the way that practice works, we can overload them, increase the intensity and increase the, the nature of the competition. Uh, probably also to kind of raise at that moment that this was a 90 minute session. We did one practice for this 90 minutes, but we were layering in this detail as we went. Because I guess the risk is you look at that screen and say there's a load of information on there. This is just a thought in the coach's head. The players don't necessarily need to be exposed to all of those things. This is the design piece. How do you design a piece of work that represents the needs of the players, the way in which you want the teams to play, and understands the environment that they're being exposed to? And I guess historically the risk can be that we run three, four, five practices in our sessions and the players spend 10, 15, 20 minutes in a particular practice. And just as they're, I guess, warming up, getting familiar with the way that the practice works, starting to learn and really adapt to the way that the practice is challenging them, we move on to another practice. And the risk is, is that we never really embed anything deeply. Whereas here, working at one practice for 90 minutes, in the practice, the players played for 54 minutes out of the 90. We use the other period of time to enable the coaches to work with the players, to enable the players to reflect on themselves and to generate a rest. Why 90 minutes? Because I guess that's the period of time that the players would typically play a game for. Why 54 minutes playing? Because depending upon the level, depending upon the league and depending upon the game, the ball is typically in play between 45 and 54 minutes in a game of football. So I guess if you want adaptation to the genuine demands of the game, it might be that we set the game up to enable that to happen. Players get 54 minutes worth of football across 90 minutes, which I guess the sort of FA led towards 70% ball rolling arbitrary targets but I guess fundamentally if you want players to get better at playing football we should probably go after them playing in a session a similar period of time and they'll be playing in the game. So hopefully a load of stuff going on there. Uh, the notes that we'll send you will have a link to the video of that which will hopefully enable some of those things that we've spoken to, to play out there. And apologies one aside the number four uh, a lad in this video called Brooklyn high performing in that group doesn't necessarily deal with things when they're going when they're difficult for him not going to see a lot of the ball, he's outnumbered two yellows to one red, so he's going to find it hard. With the coach's support, he's being stretched, I guess, what the association historically would have called in the psychological corner, but I guess he's being stressed in that way to look at his response when perhaps things aren't going well, to stick to his task and be supported by the defenders. Final thing is, there's your defensive three. They represent your back three. I guess what we certainly found at Fulham this season in the older age groups is that a lot more chances stroke goals are being generated through, I guess, what the sort of hipsters would call the half space. That space is typically between where the centre halves and the full backs are. Um, when we've played against teams that play back threes, it's been much harder to break them down because they naturally have a, a centre half positioned in that area. So we have to work harder at stretching them across the pitch, which in this example means 
getting into those spaces on a narrow pitch is really hard. So you're probably going to have to be patient on the ball, stretch the reds across the pitch before you spot the moment to go in. And obviously we spoke about Brooklyn's challenge as well. So quite a bit going on there. I guess the, the, some of the concerns in some people's mind can be everything that you're saying has got 16, 17, 18 players on the pitch, which means the player, assuming they get equal exposure to the ball, the players get the ball one in 17, which perhaps doesn't develop some of the technical elements. This is an example from an inspiring coach that I work with at Fulham that used some of similar principles, but with a smaller number. So half the number of players on the pitch, but we can still work to similar principles. I'll let this video play out because it hopefully tells its own story. Time constraint, two by five minute halves. Environmental constraint, win the game. Task constraint, blues attack an end zone. Whites attack a goal. The end zone will probably encourage forward runs and dribbles. The goal will hopefully affect finishes. So when the whites are playing, you'll probably get combination play to finish in the goal with more natural finishes. Individual stuff, nines and tens, look for the opportunities to come to and receive defeat. So centre forwards effectively. Five and sixes, who may be your centre halves, spot the times to join the attack, to step out, either on in possession of the ball or perhaps off the off the ball. So the five might play into the ten, six might join in off of the ball. Nines and tens recognise that if one of the centre halves does step out, it may be that they've got to be a bit more secure and provide some stability behind the ball. Um, and to affect transitioning, we said to the blues. If you could make a ball side interception to intercept the ball on the side that it's come from and go and score in the end zone, it gets you two goals. So hopefully, again, similar to the previous practice, the Blues are right on the front foot, really aggressive, trying to win the ball back, which makes it incredibly hard for the Whites to be able to deal with the space. Again, if we, can, if we want positive attacking play, if we heavily constrain challenge and get intensity in the defending, it will definitely raise the standard of the quality of the attacking. Final point is that focus on individuals. The blue uh, five, uh, like called Luke, gets quite nervous, tends to kick the ball off the pitch near his own goal as opposed to finding ways to play out. Coach cleverly in this practice just constrained him that if he kicked the ball off the pitch, it was a goal to the other team. And across the 45-minute piece of work, he kicked the ball off the pitch once. He was standing on the ball, finding ways to wriggle out of pressure or to combine out of pressure, which then increased the repetition of the amount of times that the Blues got the opportunity to attack. OK, starting to finish up now. So if people have got any questions, please start to consider. Um, final two messages. Here's the first one. Uh, the words at the bottom of the screen would be to encourage you to measure what you value rather than value what you can measure. Um, so again, what we sought to do this season at Fulham is to encourage coaches to decide what's important to the individuals and to the team and to select measurements that are appropriate to those particular individuals into that group. So even though we may be collecting a broad range of data, it will probably zero in either for particular individuals or for particular teams. So if a particular team focuses on pressing, which our under 18s have done well this season, rather than just arbitrarily look at possession statistics, they've focused on the passes per defensive action statistic, which uh, a guy from, called Colin Trainer from a, uh, an organisation called Statsbomb introduced probably about five, six, seven years ago now, which has now become a, a relatively significant statistic that people look at in terms of being able to measure the intensity of the press. So that's the, the, the PPDA stands for the amount of passes that the team allows before they defend it, before they uh, try to intercept uh, pressure, tackle, foul. Um, and I guess if our under-18s want to go in pursuit of that, that's something that we think is important. The lower your PPDA suggestion is the more intense your press is so before Christmas we just started to look at some of the top teams or perceived top teams in the Premier League and our own first team to look at what their PPDA was and then track it over a period of time so Liverpool's is below 10 up before Christmas it was at 9.7 but interestingly from a consistency perspective about an average of 9.5 across the last four seasons so that suggests there's been a consistent approach to their style of play Leicester's was 8.2, which has been below 10 for the first time since 2015-16, which ironically was when they were Premier League champions. So perhaps, you know, you, I guess we can 
generate causation or make links wherever we like. But the suggestion there is, is that the current managers perhaps got them more on the front foot with their press and perhaps has affected performance as a consequence. Manchester City's was 10.42 and above 10 for the first time under Guardiola. People have their own views about my, that, why that may be. Chelsea's at the end of November was 9.39, which is a decrease, a decrease from 12.88 under Conte and 10.36 under Sarri, which suggests under different managers the intensity of the press has increased. Spurs is, depending upon your view of interest in, perhaps the most interesting one in terms of the season that they've experienced this year, at 12.17, a significant increase over the last 18 months. In 2017-18, it was 8.9. Last season, when they reached the Champions League final, it was just above 10. This season, up to before Christmas, it was at 12.17. So again, if you value intense pressing, PPDA may be something that you pursue because it gives you an idea about how intensely you're pressing. Our analysts have been really clever and our coaching staff have been really clever because they've then started to look at the degree to which the pressing data is affected by the nature of the opposition and the style of play and the system that the opposition use and starting to see some trends emerge and we play against certain systems or against certain types of opposition, it positively or negatively affects our capacity to press. So again, measure what you value rather than value what you can measure. And as a consequence, I guess we need to look at if we aspire for those players to plan our first team, what does it look like in our first team playing in the championship? And just before Christmas, it was at 7.97 and it was 9.22 in the last time that Fulham were towards the top of the um, championship in the year that they were promoted from the championship into the Premier League. So some stuff there. Think about what you, what you measure. Um, think about how that is underpinned by what you value. Because I guess what can tend to happen is systems, GPS systems, uh, uh, testing systems are very good at giving us data and we can sometimes be blinded and or informed by that data without necessarily understanding why we might think that information is important. So fundamentally decide what's important, see whether or not you can get any measure of it. But also, as I'm sure you all understand, be careful about the stuff that you can't measure. Okay, so in review, Hopefully this is the journey that we've taken you on over the last 50 minutes. I guess the intention is to ask you to look at the top left. What are you focused upon? What is your vision? What values underpin it? And if you don't know yet, pick something. Arbitrarily just pick something and aim at it. Right, I'm aiming for that. Because once you've picked something and you've pursued it, it will start to give you feedback about whether or not what you're pursuing is what you want. And I guess both in my current environment and previous environments, try to develop a relatively uh, broad, loose territory that coaches can decide how to behave in. So as is, who's the player? What are the laws of football? What environment are they being exposed to? Design experiences that support the understanding of those three things. But be focused on your vision, be underpinned by your values. Once you've aimed at something, embed it. And I'll take you back to the, the, the I guess, the article, the, the, um, uh, the quote from that article, that the practice works back from the vision for the team and players. It isn't just an arbitrary possession practice for the sake of a possession practice. It understands the players, it understands the way we want to interpret the laws of football, and understands the environment they're being exposed to. So embed that in everything that you do. We try to work from the principle of having no wasted practices. We don't just run an arbitrary possession practice for the sake of it. Everything is embedded in the needs of the players with the way that we see the game playing out, understanding the environment they're being exposed to. Next element is make decisions about how to shape it on a daily basis. So my approach to practice design doesn't need to be yours, but I guess fundamentally consider how you're going to take the vision that you have for the game and place it and make it work on the grass, in the analysis suite, in the gym, anywhere else that it might necessarily occur. So aim at something, embed it, decide how to shape it on a daily basis. And then the fourth one is practice it relentlessly. And don't practice it blindly, but practice it relentlessly. Go after what you believe in fundamentally, truly, every single day. Because the risk can be that we swing based upon whoever it is that interferes with us on any given day. Someone shares us an article, someone shares us a video, we go on a course and someone gives us something, all of which might be useful and really well intended. But we probably need to understand where it fits into what it is that we're already aimed at to decide whether or not we can use it. Practice it relentlessly and reflect on the degree to which it's working and then return back to that beginning point. Is what you're aiming at right? How well embedded is it? How well are you shaping it on a daily basis? Practice it relentlessly. 
and that's hopefully a way of seeking to reflect some of the things that uh, we've tried to encourage this evening and perhaps the journey that we've taken you on. Um, I'm not encouraging people to read unless they particularly want to, but uh, a guy that's had a, a big significant effect on the way that I think certainly in sort of the last six, seven years is a guy called Dave Trott, who does come from anywhere near football. He comes from advertising. Um, he's written a fantastic book, uh, two, well, lots of fantastic books, but the two that stick in my mind are called Creative Mischief and One Plus One Equals Three. And one of the quotes that I've thought about a lot is the one that's in front of you, that breaking the rules won't get any agreement. Certainly, if you go and ask for permission, you won't get it. But break the rules, show people that it works, that then becomes part of the new rules that can't be broken. And I guess in football, creativity, individualism, perceived to be important. I guess it's an industry that's there to entertain. People that are most entertained are entertained by the people that put them on the edge, the Lionel Messi's of the world, the Cristiano Ronaldo's of the world that are perhaps so unique, so novel, that people are always looking to see what it is that they do next. As a coach, try to be the necessarily the Lionel Messi that you've got to measure up to him, but try to be unique, try to think about the things that are important to you. And if the rules are over constraining you, break them, recreate them to better support the next generation of players and coaches to leave the game in a better place than we have it in today. Thanks for listening. I'll seek to stop sharing. And if people have any questions, then I'm more than happy to uh, seek to attend to them. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Ben. We actually have the Q&A section. If you are able to pull it up, we've had a few people putting questions in already. And if anyone else has some, please feel free to add them here. We'll keep Ben for maybe another 15, 20 minutes. You know, as, as he's very busy and <laughs> he's been doing a lot of these lately. So um, we use him while we've got him, but um, I don't want to take up too much of his time. So have you got access to the Q&A section, Ben? I have, thank you, yeah. Do you want me just to work down them? Yeah, pick, pick any ones you think. Um, some of them have probably been covered in the presentation, but anything you see, and I'll get people adding in as we're going. So we'll keep going from there and I'll let you know when. Okay, I'll start at the top. So the first one says you talk about prescriptions for coaches. Do I think there should be a curriculum game model methodology for a youth club from youth club, sorry, from bottom to top? Um, I, I guess it depends what you believe to be true. Um, if you have a relatively rigid game model and you want to develop players to play in that rigid game model, it may be that that methodology comes from top down and is very, very tight, very, very narrow and develops people in a particular way. I don't necessarily believe that's right or wrong. I think if that's where your aim is, your, probably your curriculum, your game model, your methodology should probably align with that as closely as possible. Um, at, at the FA, in the 12 years that I spent there, our vision was inspire, empower and support. Um, so I guess that probably means that coach is central, context was around the outside. As a consequence, we needed to respond to them, probably with not too much of a rigid top-down DNA. Similarly at Fulham, individuals who can fulfil their potential we then want coaches to decide what's right for any given individual and that loose framework perhaps informs the way that they decide to work. So I guess to go back to that point on what you're aiming at, if you're aiming after a narrow methodology, then yeah, top down it, be very tight on your curriculum, coach this on day one, coach that on day 52, not a problem, but just be clear that that's what it is that you're in pursuit of. Uh, I'll scan to the bottom and I'll just go... Uh, um, Jody, thank you. When it comes to delivering the practice, how do you utilise and use other coaches? Um, it, it depends. Uh, I guess if you've got a deep relationship with the coaches, uh, we would probably be less explicit about what people's roles are and probably just enable the coaches to work off of each other and decide how to behave. And I guess that would be my ideal, that you get to a situation where the coaches so deeply understand, it's, understand each other uh, people don't necessarily have too much of an ego that they need to undermine other coaches with. So as a consequence, we can just respond to the players, come together at a collection of points in the session to discuss how it's going, and as a consequence, decide what we do next. Um, where it's perhaps less established, those relationships, it may be that we establish clearer roles. So the example that you saw with the two teams, it might be that one coach oversees the whole of the practice, and if there are two support coaches, one looks after the yellow team, one looks after the red team. So people have got perhaps more clearly defined roles. Again, if you've got, uh, if you're working on your own, I guess the real challenge then becomes is how do you oversee the overall practice and then focus on some of the individuals when you're working on your own? And it may be that we just have to manage our, exp ex sorry, manage our expectations in accordance to what we're seeing. Um, Ben, would there ever be a place for unopposed practice and what age would you start and stop these? Yeah, 100% there's a place for unopposed practice. Um, 
I guess, again, it depends. Do you want to do unopposed practice for everybody all of the time? And I guess sometimes the programme can say at 5.15, we're doing 45 minutes of unopposed practice and everybody is doing it. And if you want to refine technique, movement, whatever, that might be a decision that you make. I guess my preference for what it's worth would be the individual practice is individual. It isn't arbitrarily in the programme. So if um, player A is working on something, their confidence is perhaps a little bit low. Uh, the connection with the coach hasn't been particularly great because it's early in the season. It might be that we organise a 20 minute, half an hour slot outside of traditional training time where we go and work with that particular player. Because it may also be that if we can build the capacity in the players to understand what their needs are, a lot of the individual practice is stuff that they can do either at the training ground or in their own time away from the training ground to really refine those techniques. So definitely see a place for it. I think I've been probably um, placing it in the programme for everybody is perhaps depending upon your view, not the... Uh, perhaps not the universal way to approach it. Um, Matthew, what is more effective? Pre-planned pre training sessions that follow a sequence or training based on areas improvement from previous games? Um, probably be more erring more towards the side of responding to what's going on uh, as opposed to having like a rigid fixed plan that says we're going to be dealing with this. Um, I think though that I guess the more experienced we all become, probably the more comfortable, the more relaxed we are dealing with being responsive and not always necessarily knowing what's going on. Perhaps where pressure is high because we're new in a job, perhaps where uh, we've got limited experience, it may be that we need more of a uh, schedule to follow, more of a specific sequence that enables us to start to embed some of our ideas. So again, it will probably defend, depend, sorry, and perhaps be mindful of where it is that you want to go and why it is that you're going to make those decisions. Um, grassroots under 16s coach train a half pitch one and a half hours a week not ideal no what realistic outcomes could we expect uh, I'm sensing from my limited experience of the junior premier league and under 16s that it's still relatively intentional the boys or girls are probably there to to some extent for fun I guess everybody plays for fun but perhaps more intentional so I guess as much as possible is trying to get an understanding of under 16s what they want my experience of working with under 16s in a grassroots setting is typically that they like games if they're boys, they definitely like competition and physical contact. And as much as possible, I'd probably be playing games. I'd be putting competition on it and I'd be generating within the laws of the game as much physical contact as possible. Because uh, the physical contact is great for testosterone, but it's also great for building physical capacity. If I've got people leaning on me, bumping into me, I've got to learn to balance and deal with that pressure whilst managing the ball at the same time. Um, Abdullah, good question. Do you feel ethos and philosophies are thought about too much and often may not have relevance to individual players and the team? 100%. Uh, and uh, uh, my apologies if I haven't addressed that clearly enough tonight. I guess it's key that if a coach is arbitrarily deciding upon their ethos and philosophy and opposing it upon the environment, that's probably really unhelpful. And certainly earlier in my coaching career, I would have been guilty of that, uh, having a view of the way the game should be played and trying to shoehorn the players into my beliefs. Uh, perhaps as I've developed any time coaching and perhaps hopefully generated some experience it's more about trying to understand a what the purpose of the environment is getting feedback from the players the parents and the coaches about the things that are important and then deciding how to build a philosophy that as much as possible responding to those particular people and where possible i think if we afford coaches the opportunity to decide we give them a degree of freedom to decide what typically tends to happen is the coaches tend to respect that and tend to inform their decisions by going and asking the parents and the players but fundamentally if we're arbitrarily applying a philosophy on top of a group of people we haven't understood that's got the risk of possibly being uh, problematic. Um, Matt Raines what would your uh, interventions look like uh, in that particular session? Um, the one with the reds versus the yellows the 17 player practice uh, there was a collection of things uh, we played for nine minutes at a time um, and each nine minutes was followed by four stroke five minutes worth of a break. That meant that the coaches and all the players that were observing what was going on and feeling what was going on in those four or five minutes was an opportunity to catch your breath, get some feedback, I guess, which would enable you to reflect after action and then inform it while it's going on. Uh, as you watch the video, there are coaches on the outside of the session that are giving feedback to the boys while they're playing. I'm certainly driving elements of the session at times, being louder at particular moments in time to drive intensity, being quieter other times in the session. And again, I guess as much as possible, being thoughtful about that. 
the coach that shouts and screams can sometimes be seen as being a dinosaur. And I think there's a risk that we throw a lot of good behaviour into the dinosaur bucket. There are times to perhaps be louder, to perhaps drive the session, knowing that it will generate intensity in the same way that there are times to probably be quieter and calmer and able to players to drive it and perhaps to generate a little bit of time for players to think, an opportunity for them to decide. Um, Marvin, Ryan, Marvin Dempsey, sorry. Do you ever use the three hours of in the games program? Yes, 100%. Uh, I gave the example at the beginning about the um, must win competition. We also did another one where we reversed the score, which uh, played the same team twice. How many goals you score in the first game, the lead that you get to will be flipped when you play them in the second game. So my team's playing against Ryan's team. We're playing for half an hour. Ryan's team goes 1 0 up. It goes 2-0 up. There's still 15 minutes left. Ryan and his team now have to decide whether or not they run us over and go 3, 4, 5, 6 nil up, knowing that when we play the repeat game, they'll start as many goals behind as they went in front. So think about how you manage the game. Think about the decisions that you make. And in that example, we use that specifically to encourage the team to manage the game. Team got 2 nil ahead, killed the game with possession, didn't penetrate, didn't go forward, didn't play with intensity, just ran the energy out of the opposition, knowing that they were 2-0 down when they started the next game and having run the legs of the opposition were better positioned to be able to play accordingly. So 100% we're using it in the games programme. I think it's important if we're going to restrict elements of the games programme that as much as possible we engage with the opposition to agree what that might look like and then decide the degree to which we're going to tell the players what we're doing. I think sometimes the players knowing exactly what we're doing is probably helpful because it helps them understand and manage themselves in that moment. Similarly, we may make conscious decisions to not tell the players what we're doing, see how they respond when perhaps the game goes in a way that they hadn't anticipated. Um, Scott, great question. How important is understanding the individual off the pitch to ensure that you're empathetic to their situation as well as how you feed back to players? 100%. Um, I guess that kind of sort of player ownership bit can sometimes be quite... Um, can be perceived by some people being quite shallow. The player ownership is about having the whiteboard out and the players keeping the score on the whiteboard or deciding what their job is. I think the player ownership bit is as much as possible, spending time with the players, understanding the things that drive them, developing a depth of that relationship, which hopefully means that they'll begin to trust the coach as much as people can trust each other in a perceived elite environment. And for the coach to, get, to begin to understand how that player functions, the things that drive them, the things that make them anxious. And as a consequence, once we build up that library of information about individuals, we should then be drawing on that to help us understand how it is we're going to coach players, when we're going to push their buttons a little bit, when we're going to be calm and kind with them, when we're going to challenge them a little bit, when we're going to ask other players to put them under a little bit of pressure. And I guess from a coach development perspective, the same is fundamentally important. Um, the years at the association, we moved away from kind of the traditional assessment whereby you've got 45 minutes to put on a session on a particular theme that had been pre-arranged with a group of players you've never met before to coaches building their own portfolio, better understanding themselves and sharing that with the coach educator. So the coach educator began to get a deeper understanding of who that coach was, the demands of their particular environment as a consequence, how they behaved and why they behaved the way that they did. Key then is for the coach developer, the coach educator to respond to that similarly to the way that we respond to the players better understand people, understand what drives them, decide how it is they're going to support them rather than a one-size-fits-all arbitrary top-down message. A um, couple more. Um, Murray, Ben, what will your coach's coach competency framework look like? Linked into their skill set or delivery club based upon the philosophy? Um, for those that don't work in EPPP governed environments, CCF stands for Coach Competency Framework was introduced by the Elite Player Performance Plan, which is fundamentally run by the leagues, which each professional football club that would like to run an academy programme buys into. And the coach competency framework very much became a document that was effectively the coach's development plan. Uh, often what would happen is there would be a list of 20, 30, 40 points which coaches would be assessed against, uh, and that would effectively be their development plan. You're really good at communicating. You're not so good at getting, setting up practice. Work on that. Um, personal view for what it's worth, is that coach competency frameworks are hugely flawed, particularly in a lot of the ways that they've been presented. Uh, I think competence as a word is problematic. I'd probably prefer to pursue excellence. I don't want to be competent. I want to be the best person I can possibly be to support those players. I think also that the frameworks in the way that they were presented were fairly tight. You got measured between one and five or from A to E or any other arbitrary measure that you would come up with. 
and coaches often felt that they weren't necessarily a reflection of where they were working towards. In our environment, we've encouraged the coaches to build a season plan, which understands who the players are in their care, how they see the team seeking to play that season, so it gets attention between the individuals in the team, and seeks to consider the environments they're going to be exposed to across that season. Build a process or a development process that best understands that and then coach accordingly. And hopefully then that builds self-awareness of the individual needs of those players in that team. And that becomes the coach's development plan. How do we support those individuals to play the style of football that we think is important and recognise the environment that they're being exposed to? Coach owns that document, starts to recognise the things that are important, works with the disciplinary staff to build an understanding of how they bring those things to bear, reviews it on an iterative basis. Hopefully then it means that you don't end up with a coach competency framework that sits over there and a player development, uh, a player development passport, a player development programme that sits over there. The two things are in my best David Brent, connected together as deeply as they possibly can. And I think that's really important as well to highlight that there are countries that have really pursued the coach development piece strongly and there's been young or relatively young coaches that have succeeded highly. They've got into senior environments quite quickly. That hasn't necessarily been really good for player development because as soon as we remove the coach development piece and the coach competency framework from the player development piece, we're probably at risk, going back to Abdullah's question, of removing the players from the process and making it about what the coach might think is important. So we haven't got a coach competency framework in the way that it's uh, established. We've had to spend some time working with the league to say, look, we don't buy into that. We think this is important and to try to move it in a way that best supports us. Um, Hi Ben, Anthony, have you any recommendations for developing one versus one offensive players? Yeah, um, a lot of the examples that hopefully you saw is do stuff that's 1v1, um, but recognise that in a one versus one, an extreme one versus one, where it's me versus you, Anthony, there probably won't be a lot of receding. Unless you've got goals, there won't be a lot of releasing. And if you're releasing, you're not going to be releasing to another human being. So that'll get you lots of ball contact. It'll probably get you lots of individual tricks, feints, dealing with pressure, dealing with individual defenders. But it probably won't get you to understand what you might need to do to create space to get on the ball, how you might combine with somebody else to get around somebody. So as well as those extreme one versus ones, I'd probably balance it with two versus twos, three versus threes, one versus twos, three versus twos. But also recognise that in the 9v8 practice that you saw, there were lots of 1v1s created around the pitch. The three red defenders were playing against three yellow attackers. So there's still 1v1 stuff going on there. And that kind of idea of, of tactics, tactics can often be seen as this is a tactic for playing 4-4-2 against 4-3-3. Tactics are fundamentally just a decision. And I guess the more things that are going on in the environment, the more decisions I've potentially got to inform my way of thinking. Final part on this, uh, and I'm sure you guys already understand that, is that I'd probably be mindful about too and too many high-numbered game-like practices with younger players. With the 7s, 8s, 9s, 10s, I would probably err towards doing more 1v1, 2v1, 3v2, uh, 2v3 type stuff so that you are developing game understanding and tactics, but in a way that enables players to get lots and lots of touches on the balls. Uh, how do you educate parents? Do you educate parents on the benefits of this approach to parent, uh, training? Perhaps parents expect to see drills, cones, poles, etc. Should parents know some, all of the methods behind why you do what you do? Yeah, uh, do you educate parents? 100%. How do you educate parents? In as many different ways as possible. I guess you kind of have the traditional parent workshop, which can occur at the beginning of the season. The parents come in, they sit down. We've got a nice PowerPoint, not just similar to what you've seen tonight, which tells them a whole load of stuff. I guess as much as possible, it's trying to make those interactions as frequent and as kind of informal as possible. And I guess where you've got parents that perhaps are quite into their coaching, that perhaps have a view on stuff, perhaps where possible, just giving them some insight into what you're doing. Stuff that I've tended to do in the past is to give parents session plans. That's what we're doing tonight. What do you think? And start to drip feed some of those messages in. So you're influencing. Also, as much as possible, as you all know, the parents that perhaps are the ones that we can move away from because they've got strong opinions that they're quite difficult. That kind of uh, Winston Churchill quote, I don't like that man very much. I need to, need, to get, need to get to know him better. There's as much as possible walking towards the ones that provide us with challenges because the closer we can get to them, the more individual that relationship can come, probably the better. But then trying to find that balance between making sure that they know that what we're doing is in the best interest of their players whilst them understanding why we're doing what we're doing. Um, Charlotte, hi Charlotte, remember you from the A licence a few years ago, great to see you, or at least see your words on the screen. 
Uh, you spoke about players being flexible within a number of systems across the season. How much time do you spend looking at different formations and the detail within them and how do you build it into programme versus the primary formation you'd play that season? Really good question and we speak about that a lot. Um, with our oldest age group, the 23s, they've only played two systems this season. One that's been principally a reflection of the way that the first team play because I guess that's the next step for the 23s and one is, which has been more responsive to the individual players in that group. And I guess that's kind of been a conscious decision by those highly skilled staff to say, we need the players to be supported, but we need to be preparing them for the first team. Uh, our under-16s, I think, have played four systems this season. There's been much more flexibility and at times perhaps too much. But I guess at that age, we're still trying to expose them to as many different situations as possible. How does that work into the programme? I guess as much as possible, we've tried to, the 16s that have played more than one system, we're really thoughtful about at the beginning of the season being quite clear. This is our base system, if you like. This is where we're going to spend most of our time. And they've spent the majority of pre-season working through that system, practicing it as much as they possibly could. As the season started, started to filter in a second one and then a third one. And at times in games, just encourage the players to shift from system to system, but manage expectation accordingly. Because I guess the most time that we spent practicing stuff, probably the most likelihood the players are going to adapt to it. But I guess the key thing is that the way in which we go about playing is principally the same. The players just perhaps positioned in slightly different places. So hopefully some of the ways in which they play the game are quite similar. Perhaps the way the players are positioned is just a little bit different. And certainly when you go younger down the age groups, the 13s, 14s, we've needed to be mindful about not throwing too many systems at them because the risk is, is that they're relatively new to 11 v 11 football and you can perhaps uh, overload them to too great a degree. Uh, which, should we do one more, Sean? Is that OK? Yeah, let's take that one. I just wanted to say um, thank you for your... I know we've got a number of coaches who are working in the US, including myself, and that's a, that's a huge part of the responsibility here is trying to help parents who are maybe more invested financially have a clearer picture in front of that culture. So I think having someone like you I mean that you still have to go through it, even with a professional academy level, is really beneficial to the coaches we've put on. So just my, I think it's all been fantastic and we can see, but yep, if you want to pick one more to finish off with, that's great with me. OK, I'll go with Mam Rajis. Uh, I know you spoke about formations, but what do you think is more important, systems or principles of play? Uh, also, the team you spoke about plays a back three or four. In the session, you showed both teams play with a back three. Was that deliberate or would you alternate between a four and a three? Yeah, great question. Um, tend to work from the laws of football because um, that probably defines how we play. Um, people interpret the laws in different ways. Uh, based upon their experience as a coach and players will interpret the laws in different ways based upon their own capacity but yeah definitely the way in which we go about playing is more important than the specific system both teams were playing with a back three but I guess the yellow team the outside defenders were focusing more as full backs were playing higher perhaps playing as, as, as wide as the pitch were playing in wider areas and perhaps creating angles to be able to play into the full backs the opposition were playing with more of a central back three so yeah, fundamentally, you could put a four in. I think for that particular session, the team that had the back four, we wanted the centre-half, the yellow centre-half, to work on plan a one versus one against the centre-forward. So we traded off the second centre-half for that team to know that it would generate as the one versus one. Are there times we would incorporate a back four versus a back three? 100%. And I guess it's just the decisions that we make are informed by things that we might go after in that particular session. And also, fundamentally, whichever players it is that turn up for training. Um, if people have got any other questions that I haven't got to, I genuinely haven't ignored them deliberately. Um, but if there is stuff that you um, want to address, then please come back to us either through Sean, through social media, and happy to try to answer as best I can based upon my experience and knowledge. What I will do is touch on Rich Kerr. How did I come across Dave Trott? Um, a very good friend um, who I guess recognised some of the struggles that we were having um, about sort of creativity and individualism being recognised, said, have you seen this guy? And I guess at that point, I was probably quite entrenched in coaching theory books and in football books, and perhaps didn't spend enough time looking outside of football, and Dave Trott was a good man to go to. The books are also relatively short, story-focused, anecdotal, which are quite quick to read, quite humorous, and I guess quite light-hearted. So thanks for the question, Rich. Sean, thanks for having us on. Hope it's been of use. Um, I'll send the slides over. Uh, and obviously, if people have got any other questions, I'm more than happy to address them in a different forum. Yeah, I just want to echo what we're seeing in the chats and what we've seen from the questions. This has been a fantastically insightful and, and enlightening experience. The, the detail which you provided, Ben, has been, you know, for me, just as my individual perspective, this has been fantastic. And we're seeing just such good feedback from everyone already. 
that I just want to thank you again for taking the time to, to join us and for, for sharing your experience and for sharing your, your knowledge, which is really the key to helping us all improve and develop. So from my perspective, just thank you again. And for everyone who joined us, thank you for joining. We will be having a session with um, Matt Pilkington, the New York City FC under 19 head coach on Thursday. And we've got a couple more lined up again next week. So keep your eyes out for those as we get the registrations up and going. But for now, just thank you so much again, Ben. And everyone enjoy the rest of their, their days, wherever in the world you may be. Sean, everyone, thanks very much. Good night.